Okay, so we got our recording. Today's presentation is from Liquors to Bitters, the history of the Fee Brothers in Rochester. I gotta say on a warm summer afternoon like this, perfect time to have a talk about delicious cold beverages. The Fee Brothers are a Rochester institution, starting out as a wine company and moving into bitters during, uh, <laughs> sorry, and moving into bitters uh, during prohibition in the 1920s. Today, we're very happy to welcome Emily Mori uh, as our presenter. Historian, author, and cocktail enthusiast, Emily C. Mori was born in Ottawa, Canada, and later moved to Montreal, where she studied American history at McGill University. She earned her PhD at the University of Rochester, where she focused on African-American history, urban studies, and popular culture. Her first book, Rochester Through Time, co-written with Mary Grenier, was published in 2016. She continues to research and write about local history as both a freelance writer and a proud employee of the Rochester Public Library. And also very proud to say she's one of my coworkers. Without further ado, Emily Mori. Hello everyone, thank you Brandon for that lovely introduction uh, and thank all of you for um, joining us on this talk indoors today when you could be enjoying the beautiful weather outside. So thanks for showing up. All right, let's get started. If you've ever sat at a bar in Rochester, chances are you've seen these kinds of bottles before. If you've never sat at a bar in Rochester, this might not be the right talk for you. The company that makes these products called Bitters has been a Rochester institution for 156 years. Fee Brothers is a family run business now in its fourth generation. And while the company is now known all over the world, it experienced several ups and downs during, during its lengthy existence. The history of the Fee Brothers offers a unique story of a local resilient family business, but it also reflects the evolution of the liquor industry in this country and how drinking culture has shifted over time. The original Fee Brothers were the four sons of Owen and Margaret Fee, Irish immigrants from County Monaghan. And like many local Irish immigrants in the early 19th century, the Fees came to the Flower City via Canada, having spent time in Quebec before relocating to Rochester in the late 1830s. The family settled into the part of the city known as Dublin. Comprising the area of Saint Paul, surrounding St. Paul Street between Lowell Street and Central Avenue, Dublin counted over 60 Irish families by the time the Fees arrived in the 1830s. The following decade, Owen Fee established a butcher shop on Dublin's main drag of St. Paul Street, but he suffered an untimely death at the age of 41, which left his wife Margaret to support the couple's five children, Owen, John, James, Joseph, and Mary. The couple's eldest son, James Fee, was 16 at the time of his father's death. He'd been working since he was just a boy and was quick to help out his mother in any way he could. For a time, he sold sandwiches to train passengers coming through Rochester's railroad station. He then landed a job that would prove deeply influential on his future career. In the late 1850s, young James Fee began working as a clerk for James McManus, a local grocer and liquor dealer who ran a shop at the southwest corner of South St. Paul Street, now known as South Avenue, and Main Street. This would be the, the current site would be where the Rochester Riverside Convention Center is now. The young man excelled in the business and joined by his mother and brothers Owen and John Fee, who is, by the way, Stephen Colbert's great grandfather. James Fee assumed ownership of the store in 1864 after McManus moved to a new location. The business began as a multi pronged grocery operation, wherein the Fee sold both foreign and domestic liquor. They also manufactured cigars for a time and ran a saloon and a deli on the premises. But by the 1870s, James Fee decided to focus solely on liquor imports and sales. In 1874, at which time Rochester boasted 26 liquor dealers, James and his brothers Owen, John, and Joseph moved their operation to 26 North Water Street, then four years later relocated to a sizable five-story structure directly across the street. This map shows the building's location on Water Street, just north of Main Street. Uh, if this seems hard to place, it's because Water Street doesn't actually run into Main Street anymore. 
This is the area as it looks today. So the Rochester Riverside Hotel, or what remains of that building, uh, now marks the approximate spot of where the Fee Brothers building once stood. At their new Water Street location, the Fee Brothers came to dominate the import game, stocking British gins, Jamaican rums, Irish and Scottish whiskies, and the finest wines and cognacs from continental Europe. The Fees also became the local distilling agents for major Pennsylvania and Kentucky firms, offering colorfully named products like Mountain Dew Rye and Bluegrass Bourbon. In the company's nascent years, the Fee brothers alternately referred to themselves as distilling agents or rectifiers rather than distillers, since they didn't manufacture the alcohol they sold, but received products from actual distillers and then rectified them to suit local tastes. So often in practice, this meant mixing together a bunch of different whiskeys or a bunch of different cognacs and bottling them. In 1883, the family business rebranded itself from James Fee and Brothers to just Fee Brothers. At the time, there were four other rectifying businesses in town. Fee Brothers eventually became the most prominent one. The company boasted in its advertisements that their five-story headquarters at 21 to 27 North Water Street was the largest wine and liquor house in America. Having such an immense facility allowed the brothers to expand their rectifying efforts and try their hand at winemaking. Using grapes from their Genesee Valley vineyard and winery, they blended and bottled wine in the basement of the building and stored it in their sub-basement cellar. This image is an artist rendering of the Genesee Valley vineyard and winery. The expanse of the vineyards has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, the building pictured stood at 1180 St. Paul Street on the corner of Avenue A. It was later repurposed as the Jewish home for the aged. So you can see on this map here where it indicates Caroline L. Fee, that would have been the location of the uh, winery and vineyard. So that's the corner of St. Paul Street and Avenue A. Um, and that same corner is where Roberto Clemente School number eight now stands. Well, unlike the Fee Winery, the company's downtown liquor storefront was directly adjacent to the river. The warehouse's proximity to the Genesee had its drawbacks. Rochester suffered a series of major floods around the turn of the century, and often enough, rising waters from the Genesee seeped into the Fee Brothers wine cellar. Fortunately, they didn't permeate the collection of wine barrels that occupied the sub-basement. However, bottling the contents of the barrels proved impossible until someone had the idea to bring a rowboat into the cellar. Fee employees would then row from cask to cask and siphon off whatever they needed to bottle. The warehouse suffered additional disasters via a series of three fires that beset the building in the first decade of the 20th century. The first two occurred in 1901 and 1903. The last and worst of the conflagrations occurred on a frigid February day in 1908. The fire first broke out on the building's fifth floor, which was then occupied by a shoe company. It quickly spread, leading the top two floors to fall into the center of the building and crash straight down to the ground floor. Because it was so cold out, the fire was nearly impossible to contain, and it soon spread to surrounding buildings. In the end, the fire completely destroyed the Fee Brothers building and resulted in a quarter of a million dollars loss. That would be over $7 million in today's currency. The Fee Brothers managed to salvage some of their liquor stock, but they had to rebuild their headquarters and their business from the bottom up. It wasn't long, however, before the company faced another blow to their business. The temperance movement had deep roots in Rochester. Before the village was even incorporated as a city in 1834, a budding anti-alcohol society had already been established. The local temperance movement ebbed and flowed over the course of the 19th century and gained substantial mo momentum in the 1890s when Rochester reformer Clinton N. Howard formed the Prohibition Union of Christian Men. The organization, which counted some 3,000 members, advocated against the use and abuse of alcohol and took pains to ensure that Rochester's saloons remained closed on Sundays and that all liquor was served with sandwiches in accordance with the Reigns Law of 1896. By the turn of the 20th century, temperance societies had taken root across the United States. 
The cause, led by the Anti-Saloon League, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and the Prohibition Union, steadily gained followers in the 1910s, as alcohol became increasingly viewed as a cause of family violence, political corruption, workplace inefficiency, and various social evils. It became clear to many in Rochester that it was only a matter of time before the growing tre temperance trend was codified into law. This obviously spelled trouble to local proprietors and employees of the brewing and distilling industries, as well as those who made their living selling alcoholic products to fellow Rochesterians. On October 28, 1919, Congress passed the Volstead Act, which laid the groundwork for the 18th Amendment, banning the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol in the United States to go in effect the following year. In November 1919, less than a month after the Volstead Act was passed, Fee Brothers began selling off their empty cider, beer, wine, and liquor barrels and kegs in preparation for the impending unavoidable change in their business model. Rather than shutting down completely, many local businesses in the alcohol trade repurposed their factories toward the manufacture of legal products. Rochester's largest pre-prohibition brewer, the Bartholomew Brewing Company, began producing dairy products such as milk and ice cream. The American Brewing Company rebranded themselves as the Rochester Food Products Corporation and turned their efforts toward malt extract, apple cider, and near beer, which contained less than one half of 1% of alcohol and was therefore legal. Fee Brothers, for their part, suffered a dual tragedy. Not only did prohibition spell a major blow to the company's livelihood, but three months after the passing of the 18th Amendment, the company experienced the passing of its founder, James Fee. James Fee's children, James Leo and Marguerite, had been running the business since their father took ill. But following their father's death, the pair decided to auction off much of the company's equipment and left Rochester. Rather than see the family firm fold, their cousin, John C. Fee II, recently stationed with the military, began buying back the goods his cousins had sold. And like other prohibition era entrepreneurs steeped in Rochester's liquor trade, adapted his business model. Under John Fee's leadership, Fee brothers catered to prohibition era Rochesterians in a few different ways. Firstly, they sold a number of non-alcoholic products like ginger ale and grape juice. They also distributed various brands of near beer, like this version made by Budweiser. And like some of the local breweries in the Prohibition era, Fee Brothers also sold malt extract. The malt extract was always branded as being for cooking and baking purposes, and usually came with the warning not to add yeast, as it was likely that the malt would ferment. But one can assume that most purchasers of the product were hoping for this very result. It's worth mentioning that Rochester didn't actually witness a huge decline in alcohol consumption following the passing of the 18th Amendment. Rochesterians, for the most part, didn't give up alcohol in the face of prohibition. They just found more creative, if sometimes illegal, ways to obtain it. Some industrious citizens took it upon themselves to shore up their own sources of alcohol, cooking up home brews and sometimes dubious liquors in the bathrooms, attics, and basements of their private residences. This illicit hooch was often as potent as it was unpleasant in taste, which led to a resurgence in the popularity of cocktails. Here, the Fee brothers saw an opportunity. The firm began producing a number of pleasant tasting products that consumers could combine with their less than savory alcohol to make cocktails. The cocktail actually has a pretty lengthy history in the United States. Many historians date its creation, or at least the use of the term itself, to 1806, when a newspaper out of Hudson, New York, used the word cocktail to describe one of the drinks served to lubricate voters at political rallies. Now, there's a number of theories as to the origins of the word cocktail. In England, a cocktail was a horse that had its tail docked to indicate that it was of a mixed breed. This term was used in turn to describe a person who had attained social standing, but lacked good breeding. It's possible that the name for the practice of mixing a pure spirit with other ingredients came from this British expression. 
Another theory holds that the name cocktail derives from early taverns where the tap on a barrel was called a cock and the last dregs from the tap were referred to as the tail or tailings. Yet another theory suggests that the term comes from the wake-up call of the rooster or cock since these drinks were frequently consumed at breakfast time in the early 1800s. Regardless of the exact origins of the name cocktail, it was generally accepted that this original cocktail was con constituted any combination of liquor with sugar, water, and bitters. Bitters were and are a flavoring agent made from infusing a combination of a number of ingredients, often roots, barks, fruit, peels, spices, herbs, or flowers, in high proof alcohol. Small amounts of bitters are dashed into cocktails for varying purposes. They can tamp down an overly sweet drink, cut through an overly rich flavor, unite a bunch of disparate ingredients, or add an overall aromatic spiciness to a drink. While bitters were an essential part of the cocktail throughout the 19th century, by the time prohibition was enacted in 1920, the term cocktail had basically come to mean any mixed drink served before dinner, whether or not it contained bitters. Nevertheless, bitters were one of the products that Fee Brothers began producing in the Prohibition era. Their orange bitters sold decently enough during these dry years, but it would prove instrumental to the company's success many years later. More popular than bitters during this era were any kind of product that could, that could completely mask the unpleasant flavors of illicitly made alcohol. Fee Brothers developed a whole line of syrups, cordials, and other mixers for just this purpose. We can see in this 1931 advertisement that the Fee Brothers suggested their fruit syrups be mixed with cold water or white rock. White rock was a brand of mineral water at the time. It's certainly possible that some consumers mix the syrups with water, but in all likelihood, many were blending them with something a little stronger. This advertisement from 1930 perhaps suggests a bit of eye winking on the part of the Fee Brothers. First of all, the use of the term smooth blender could suggest that consumers might be mixing the product with something that was less than smooth, like homemade alcohol, perhaps. It's also notable that the ad makes a reference to partying with the life of the party. And lastly, that it informs customers that the company had published a cocktail recipe book for budding mixologists. In addition to the alcohol adjacent products Fee Brothers manufactured during Prohibition, the company also continued to make limited amounts of real alcohol as well. In 1922, the ban on sacramental spirits was lifted, which meant that Fee Brothers could resume wine production. The company had been making sacramental wine, also known as altar wine, since the late 1880s. As church requirements for altar wine were pretty stringent, Manufacturers often obtained endorsements from notable men of the cloth to ensure fellow clergy that their wines were being produced under exacting standards by individuals of high moral character. Fee Brothers even published a booklet, pictured here, filled with testimonial letters penned by various local priests, as well as the Bishop of Cebu, Philippines. The Bishop, Thomas A. Hendrick, had been a priest at St. Bridget's Church in Rochester and wrote of James and John Fee. I cheerfully testify that I've known both of you for 30 years and know that you have been continuously members of this parish since it was formed in 1854, that you were the first altar boys and have since that time always been earnest supporters of the church. I also testify that your reputation as, as businessmen is and has been of the highest character and that your representations may be received with full faith. While the church may have been strict about who could produce sacramental wine, it was seemingly not as rigorous about who could procure the potent potable. Fee Brothers sales to churches skyrocketed by 800% during Prohibition. Unless Rochester witnessed a weekly wave of plastered parishioners in the 1920s, a phenomenon not documented in the local papers, some, if not the majority of this wine was being consumed outside of Sunday services. This is a label of one of the many varieties of altar wine that Fee Brothers produced. And here's a photo from the Fee Brothers warehouse depicting giant barrels filled with altar wine. 
you might be able to read on the left there the lettering on the barrel Vain de Concorde altar wine. Those with church connections were not the only ones drinking Fee Brothers wine in the midst of prohibition. A clause in the prohibition law allowed heads of household to manufacture up to 200 gallons of wine per year for their own use. They just weren't allowed to buy or sell it. Keep in mind that one gallon is about the equivalent of five bottles of wine, which means that legally households were allowed to produce up to 1,000 bottles of wine a year for their personal use. Seeing this as a loophole, Fee Brothers began selling winemaking kits. After receiving an order for a kit, a Fee employee would go to the client's home with a barrel and fill it with grape juice concentrate called Vinglo. They then mix this with water, sugar, and yeast. Then they would insert a bubbler tube into the barrel's bunghole. Upon request, the fee representative would return a few months later to bottle, cork, and even label the finished product. The service proved especially popular with the city's well-to-do, as suggested by the Fee Brothers sales records. This is the Fee Brothers record book for its winemaking kits. And in it, the fees listed the names of their customers, the date of their purchase, the number of kits sold, and the name of the fee employee that helped the client make the homemade wine. The names in the book read almost like a directory of Rochester's elite. Here are just some of the Rochesterians that were consuming considerable spirits during the so-called dry era. Lafayette R. Blanchard. Blanchard was the president of Gannett Newspapers and the longtime editor of the Democrat and Chronicle. John P. Day was the vice president of the Genesee Valley Trust Bank. Francis J. French, the president of French's Mustard, was also a client of the fees. Pritchard H. Strong consumed fee wine. Ironically, he was the president of a firm called the Puritan Soap Company, uh, and he would later become an assemb assemblyman. Fellow politician Fred J. Slater used the fees services. He was a state senator. William F. Love was not only a district attorney, but before the end of prohibition, he became a justice of the state, state Supreme Court. And finally, this is Frank A. James, who was Rochester's fire chief. I should mention that in addition to the fire chief, there were also several women registered in the fees book whose husbands happened to be police officers. There were also many doctors and many lawyers on the list. As the fees records suggest, Rochester's elite class, as well as its lawmakers and law enforcers, were not suffering terribly during the Prohibition era. And thanks to the range of cocktail mixers the company made, Rochesterians who were making or pur purchasing less palatable forms of alcohol were also getting by. The Fee Brothers' temporary line of non-alcoholic offerings, along with their legally produced altar wines and winemaking kits, allowed the company to survive prohibition. And when the Noble Experiment reached its conclusion in 1933, Fee Brothers was the first local firm to carry the formerly contraband product. On December 4th, 1933, employees bottled more than 3,000 cases of sherry, port, and wine in preparation for the end of the 13-year-long alcohol ban the following day. The company also ordered 1,000 cases of whiskey and gin for rush delivery, but were informed that only 100 cases could be ordered at a time due to the high demand. Under the leadership of John C. Fee II, the firm once again offered a wide array of liquors before deciding to focus solely on wine in the late 1830s, or 1930s rather. John Fee rather later proposed scaling back even further, informing his wife Blanche in 1951 that he wanted to get out of the alcohol business and focus on non-alcoholic products instead. He died from a heart attack shortly thereafter. In accordance with her husband's final wishes, which were unknown to the rest of the family at the time, Blanche contacted the New York State Liquor Authority, whose agents inspected the company's leftover inventory before breaking up the remaining wine barrels with hatchets and dumping their contents into the Genesee River directly behind the fee building. With the business's future profits awash in the river, Fee Brothers had no choice but to develop a new line of products in order to stay afloat. A return to the company's prohibition era incarnation was deemed the most logical option. 
1955, the Fees sold their longtime Water Street warehouse and relocated their scaled down operation to a new factory space at 114 Field Street in the Upper Monroe neighborhood. This is how the building looked when the Fee brothers occupied it. And this is how it appears now. And the location of the building is on Field Street number 114, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. At the new Field Street location, the business was carried on by members of the second and third generations of the family. Blanche Fee, her daughter Nancy, and son John C. Fee III, better known as Jack. Jack Fee had been working as a chemist for Kodak when he joined the family firm in 1951. Not wishing to give up his day job, Jack continued working at Kodak and spent his evenings tinkering with new Fee Brothers products, learning as he went and often testing them out on his boss or lucky neighbors during cocktail hour. These experimentations were necessary because the company had only a couple of non-alcoholic products to its name in the 1950s. While the Fees had had an abundance of non-alcoholic offerings during Prohibition, the only recipes that they had saved were those for their orange bitters and their frothy mixer. The frothy mixer was something that John Fee II had developed. In the Prohibition era, a number of cocktails, such as the whiskey sour, called for egg whites. But since eggs weren't regulated then as they were now, it wasn't uncommon to contract salmonella from these drinks. Fee's frothy mixer served as a safer product that one could use instead of egg whites. Building upon the frothy mixer and bitters recipes, Jack expanded the family firm's non-alcoholic line to include countless cordials, bitters, mixers, and syrups like grenadine and orgeat syrup. These proved to be popular products in the 1950s as sweet and fruity cocktails like the Mai Tai and the Grasshopper became fashionable. Here are some packages for other mixers the company produced uh, for Bloody Marys, sour mix, margarita mix, and screwdrivers. But while classic cocktails experienced a heyday in the 1950s and 1960s, by which time Fee Brothers had moved to its current location on Portland Avenue, they fell out of favor in the 1970s and 1980s, as trends turned towards lighter drinks and less imaginative cocktails. Fee Brothers experienced leaner times during these years, and by the late 1980s, Jack Fee was beginning to think that he might have to shut down his family's long running business. Then the company once again experienced a rebirth, this time thanks in part to the internet. In the early 1990s, when the World Wide Web was still in its nascent years, various cocktail enthusiasts and historians began chatting with each other on message boards. One of these cocktail historians, a man by the name of Ted Hay, discovered that the original recipe for the Manhattan cocktail contained orange bitters. At the time, there was only one company in the world making orange bitters, and it was a family business in Rochester named Fee Brothers. Ted Hay began talking up Fee Brothers on the internet, and this helped spark a renewed interest in the company. Hay and his fellow cocktail historians would then go on to publish several books that would help inspire a cocktail revival. It was in the midst of this cocktail revival that the, that the Fee Brothers business really took off. The firm received an additional boost when Angostura, the Trinidad-based company often credited with originating bitters, halted production for a time during the 2000s and redirected their customers to Rochester. As Jack Fee informed the Democrat and Chronicle, things turned around like a bloody boomerang. Jack Fee's son Joe and daughter Ellen played a major role in redeveloping the family business during this phase. Ellen, as production manager, helped expand Fee Brothers line to include some 98 products, including 18 varieties of bitters. Joe Fee, who sadly passed away in February, wore many hats at the company and served as its indefatigable sales rep, peddling Fee Brothers products at bars, restaurants, and trade shows all over the world. Thanks to the perseverance and resilience of the Fee family members, the local business that James Fee started in a small Rochester grocery store in 1864 now ships its products to almost every state in the country and every continent except Antarctica. And that's everything. Brandon, are there any questions? 
There have not been any questions in the chat thus far. Does anyone have any questions? Feel free to type them in or to turn on your camera and ask them directly. Hi there. Very nice. Hello. Can you can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, well, so I'm a long I'm a long time Fee Brothers guy, but one of the things I did want to mention to you, which I have always found interesting, is it's a lot harder to find Fee Brothers in New York State than it is around the world because New York State law doesn't allow a lot of the distributors to have glycerin-based bitters. They have to have alcohol-based bitters. And Fee Brothers went to glycerin-based bitters, not not alcohol-based bitters. So when you walk in your bar here in Rochester, you can be very frustrated because they may not have Fee Brother bitters there, and Fee Brothers can be right down the street. So that's that's an interesting point. I actually um, I did a trip uh, to New York City last spring, um, during which I frequented a few uh, bars, and um, I was actually surprised at the number of them that did carry. Uh, Fee Brothers. It was it was pretty impressive that a lot of these top cocktail and speakeasy type establishments in New York City um, really go to Fee Brothers as their number one choice for for bitters and those kinds of products. Yeah, and in their case, they will go out of the way uh, to get it because um, of the origin. Like they're, they're, but they have to go to a different distributor to get it instead of from the distributor that's selling all the alcohol to them. So in other words, they have to buy it through like the grocery distributor instead of buying it through the alcohol distributor. So right. you can still do it. It's just, it's just not so easy. And if you walk into a liquor store here in New York State, it is very difficult to find Fee Brothers on the shelf of a liquor store. You can get it at a Wegmans, but you can't get it at a liquor store. Mm -hmm. That's very frustrating. And I, I have a funny picture. I don't know if you want me to share my screen, but um, as I travel around the world, I go to all these little places. I've been to these little places all over. But the funniest picture I have is in a little tiny whiskey bar outside of Taiwan, where I had the guy line up the Fee Brothers that he was using for his. Uh, so, so if you want that photo, if I can share my screen, does this let you me do that? Or is that possible, Brandon? Um, I'd have to allow you to do so. Um, one second here. Are you Chuck McPhee? I am. Yes. One second. I think I can let you do that. I think you'll find it kind of funny. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's clean me. I have a share screen button. Oh, you need to do it. That's can. fine. So yeah, I, I, I could send that to you if you, uh, if you send me something, yeah. I wanted it, but, um, oh, actually, you know what? I have it on my other, hold on one second. Let's do this. The really can funny we spotlight way. the other interpreter. I'm sorry. Yep. One second. Sorry about that. Should be all set now. Does this work? Yeah. Oops. Uh, can you see this guy? Yeah. Where, where's the photo? Is it up? Uh, no, I can't share my screen. Um, so okay. what I was doing was, if you guys can see me, I was just going, I was just uh, trying to show my other uh, screen. Can you see me? I don't see my, I see the interpreter now. I don't, I don't know if I'm visible. Yeah, you can see my I can face. see you. Yeah, we can see so, you. So let's see here. It, this is the picture. I don't know if this. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Oh my that's goodness. great. I've seen fees all over the world in bars, Japan, it's Italy. Working good, but I'm actually showing it on a different computer screen. Yes. Yeah. So it's really cool, but it's a neat thing. If you get a chance when you're traveling around the world, you get to a whiskey bar, you yeah, ask yeah. them about fee bitters. And this particular guy knew the whole story of fee bitters in this little tiny bar in Taiwan. So I just figured I'd mention that. That's, that's incredible. Wow. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I knew Joe Fee personally. I, I used to do computer work for him. And um, uh, he was an amazing storyteller. He was great at telling the story of his company and 
what they did and how they came to be and everything. And I think that's part of what made him a great uh, salesperson. Yeah, absolutely. I, I unfortunately never had the chance to meet him. I met um, his sisters and his niece, um, but I've heard all kinds of stories about what a affable uh, fellow he was. All of this is making me realize I have to do a lot more research. Um, my great grandfather owned a liquor store uh, in the Black Rock section of Buffalo. So I'm now based on all this, I've got to do some research to see what all he carried. He also at one time was the proprietor of a saloon in Kansas City, Missouri during Prohibition. So um, Missouri did not enact the um, or implement the federal law. So apparently that's how he got away with it. <laughs> wow. Great. We had another person ask about the sacramental wine that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, was it actually good to drink by today's standards? Uh, I don't have a time machine, so I can't uh, <laughs> go back and, and, and tell you. But I mean, it was it was wine made like any other wine. Um, so it was, you know, I, I would assume like, you know, the equivalent of a table wine, you know. Uh, but again, I, I can't uh, vouch for it 100% because I haven't tasted it. But I'm guessing. Any other questions? Do you have any idea if he um, used local grapes or imported grapes or? Um, as far as I know, they were grapes from the Finger Lakes region. Um, I don't know exactly which part of the Finger Lakes region, but um, this, this area, local, local stuff. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. That was very nice. Okay. Well, thank you all. Yeah, that went a lot quicker than I thought it was going to go, but I realized the last time I did this talk, I had folks asking questions during it and they were a very inquisitive bunch. Um, so sorry that that ran a little short, but uh, this gives everyone a chance to enjoy the rest of this beautiful day and, and perhaps uh, make a cocktail using Fee Brothers products. Yes, and I I'll also recommend that, that book that you showed. Maybe it's at the library, but I own that book and I would highly recommend, uh, we've done parties at our house where we've taken those old retro cocktails and, and served those. And that's a really great book that you showed in your in your slide set from uh, Haig, Dr. Cocktail. I can't Dr. remember Cocktail. his real yeah. name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's a big name. So when he got on board with fees, that was pretty, uh, you know, life changing for them. And he actually consulted with Fee Brothers on their um, peach bitters, which is one of their more popular bitters. Yeah. Mm. All right, is that it? Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Brandon, do you have a wrap up statement about Rochester's rich history? I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming out today. Uh, glad you're all able to join us on this beautiful afternoon. I guess it's time for us all to do, well, except for me, I'm working the rest of the day, but the rest of you too to go enjoy a cocktail <laughs> with some few brothers product. Um, we are done with this season of rich history. We'll return in September. I can actually tell you that our September presentation will be very different from today's topic. Uh, it's going to be a talk on the history of Asbury First United Methodist Church uh, by Reverend Stephen Cady in honor of its 200th anniversary, actually on the date of its bicentennial, September 19th. And uh, if no one has any further questions, I guess we'll call it a day for Rochester's Rich History. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.